Hi, this is Cara Jenkinson. I'm, I'm one of the vice chairs of the Liberal Democrat Federal Conference Committee. This autumn, we're really keen to encourage new voices at conference. If you've not spoken at a conference before, now might be the time to give it a go. There'll be debates across a wide range of topics, and we're keen to hear from people who may have direct experience of the issues being debated from their personal lives, or perhaps have professional ex expertise that they can add. The first step is to look at the conference agenda. Once you've decided on the debate that you would like to contribute to, make sure that you put in a speaker's card by 5pm on the evening before the debate is due to happen. I call it a speaker's card, but actually it's now an electronic form, which you can access via the conference website. You'll need to put in a bit of information about yourself, about what you'd like to say and what you'd add to the debate. You'll hear back the evening before the debate if you've been chosen to speak. The conference team will schedule a short technical check and will let you know how to join the debate. We've put together a few short tips on writing a great conference speech. Bex and Duncan are here to share them. Everyone prepares for a conference speech slightly differently. However, the aim of this is to provide some general tips that can help you however you prepare. Firstly, some people will write out their whole speech and read it off, whereas others will read from bullet points. But regardless of which one of these you use, make sure that any facts you want to quote are accurately written down and clearly marked on your paper, underlined or highlighted if this will help you, because you want to be able to clearly and correctly quote them in your speech in order for them to give the most impact. Secondly, I always make sure I have at least one backup point because you never know what the speaker before you was going to say. And if their whole speech is focused on one of the points you were going to make, it can be helpful to be not repeating that same point. And finally, three minutes isn't as long as you feel it's going to be. So don't try to fit seven points into a three minute speech. You will either end up getting cut off halfway through or you'll be speaking so quickly that no one watching the debate will be able to understand the points you make. Pick the points you feel will fit best into the speech and focus on making them the best speech you can. Best of luck to all of you in your conference speeches in the future. Hello, my name's Duncan Brack. I've been giving speeches at conference for more years than I care to remember. I've been asked to give you some tips on speaking at conference, so here they are. First, make sure you know how much time you've got. The maximum allowed lengths for speeches are printed in the conference agenda at the end of each motion. They're normally three minutes, unless you're giving the opening or closing speeches on motions or amendments. That means you can calculate how many words you can fit into your speech. An average person speaks at about 150 words a minute, but you might well want to go faster than that to give your speech pace and urgency, or sometimes slower to emphasise your main points. But if you go too fast, your audience might not follow you, and if you go too slow, they might be bored. And if you run over your time, you risk being cut off by the conference chair. Either way, practice your speech in advance, record it and play it back to yourself to check whether it sounds okay and whether it fits into your time. Give a few speeches and you'll find the natural speed that works best for you. Second, write your speech out in the way you like. I write my speeches word for word, which makes it easy to time them, but it does risk making them sound a bit stilted, though I think I can usually avoid that. Many people prefer just writing down headings or brief notes or using cards rather than paper. Whatever you feel most comfortable with will work best for you. Third, be absolutely clear about what you're arguing for and what you want conference to do. If you want them to vote against the motion or for it or for or against a particular bit of it, tell them that right at the start, explain why, and then tell them again at the end. Don't waste time introducing yourself or telling them your life story unless it's directly relevant to your argument. You're there to persuade them to vote the way you want them to, so be as clear as possible about why. Fourth, don't get worried if you get nervous in advance. Everyone does, no matter how experienced they are. Take your nervous energy and put it into your speech. Giving a speech at conference is challenging and nerve-wracking, but it teaches you to focus on what you really believe and what you really think about the motion that's being discussed, and it gives you a real adrenaline buzz. So my final tip is, enjoy yourself.
Good afternoon, uh, conference, and welcome to F30, uh, Tackling the Cost of Living Crisis, which you will find on page 74 of the agenda. There are several drafting amendments, which you can find on page 78A uh, of the agenda, and three amendments, which you will uh, find on 78B and 78C of the agenda. Um, we have had two requests for separate votes, um, but the FCC has decided against those. Um, and um, as you will have seen earlier, we have had some technical difficulties in getting all our speakers online. Apologies for that, but that does mean that I have to ask you all, um, all speakers in this debate to take particular care uh, to keep the time. Um, so can I ask Jenny Randerson, please, to stand by? And I now call Christine Jardin, our Treasury spokesperson, to move the motion. Christine. Good afternoon, conference. And it's, um, well, I would love to say it's a pleasure to be proposing this motion, but believe me, very little to do with the cost of living at the moment it is much fun for anybody. After two of the most challenging years that I hope any of us will ever have to endure, the current cost of living crisis is putting families all over this country under immense pressure. The cost of heating their homes, driving their cars if they can afford it, cooking food, buying food, all of us will face it to some degree but there are households who find it impossible to make ends meet. People who will struggle, children, will go hungry. The biggest cost of living crisis in a generation and the biggest economic squeeze since the 1970s is with us now. And for those of us old enough to remember the 70s, that is a sobering thought. I wouldn't wish those times on anyone. But what we have to do now, what this motion calls on us to do, is set out for the country what we would do to fix it and call on the government to do what they should be doing to fix it, to support families through this storm. First of all, I should say that is why I'm happy to support Amendments 1 and 2, which seem perfectly sound policies to help ease the burden while helping tackle COVID and support sustainable travel. I kind of wish I'd thought of them myself, actually. But our main focus in this must be to help people meet the mounting cost of living now. Stop the Tory tax hikes, which will hit those on average earnings. The stealth tax, which will hit hardest those who are struggling the most and will actually mean a reduction in incomes against inflation. And that conference is why I'm afraid I cannot support Amendment 3. I can't come here and say, OK, let's go with the, the tax allowance freeze. Let's agree with the Tories. No, I can't. I can't say that. It would be increasing the tax burden in real terms on those earning least. Freezing the tax allowance threshold, giving up on a thresh tax threshold policy, which in government we fought tooth and nail to achieve and to persuade the Tories to accept, wouldn't be progressive. Because what the Tories will do, sorry, what the Tory freeze will do is force one and a half million low earners, people earning less, would you believe, than £12,500 a year to pay income tax. And that would come at the worst possible time for them. I believe, and I know you do too, that to be fair, tax needs to be progressive. When you earn more, you pay more. But this tax hike will penalise people who won't see a real increase in their, their earnings. It will serve them with a tax bill simply for maintaining their current standard of living by keeping their wages in line with inflation. That's not progressive and it's not fair. Opposing the freeze isn't the same as a tax cut. It simply means we oppose the government in raising taxes for the lowest earners. And how often in the past 50 years, how often since those awful years in the 70s, has it been more important than it is right now to do what it takes to help those families maximise their chances of making ends meet. 
And I hear the arguments about universal basic income. I've been making most of them myself for the past two years, and I chair the cross-party parliamentary group. I desperately want to fix a welfare state, which I no longer believe is fit for purpose. But right now, this crisis is the priority. A crisis that means if we freeze the tax allowance threshold, families who earn the least will be facing a real terms cut. It's a stealth tax, which will make life more difficult, not help. But rejecting that is not the only thing we need to do and we need to call on the government to do. And this motion makes it clear. We need them to scrap the unfair national insurance hike, which disproportionately impacts low earners. They should be protecting pensioners from rising prices, including the one and a half million low income people on pension credit. They should be uprating pensions in line with the Bank of England's inflation forecast of 7%, 7%. The Tory government dropped the triple lock because they said it was proposing a ridiculous increase for pensioners because inflation would be low and the pensions increase would be high. It's the other way around. They also need to reinstate the £1,000 boost to universal credit to support the most vulnerable households, get proper support. The warm home discount should be doubled to £300 and extended to everyone on pension credit and universal credit. And they should double the winter fuel allowance payment to all pensioners for this year. Banks should play their part too. So we should reverse the 63% cut to the corporation tax banking surcharge. And support those in universal credit with mortgage costs by reinstating the pre-2018 format of the support for mortgage interest schemes. Most importantly, though, this motion calls for a year-long windfall tax on the record profits of gas producers and traders. Now, those of you who know me will know that I have spent a lot of my life in the northeast of Scotland. I know how important that industry is. I know that its stability is crucial. Our, our energy security is crucial. But for a year, we need to use those massive profits that they'll be making to pay for what we need to do to target help at the, the most vulnerable. And this week, Ed, he revealed what should be the last piece of the jigsaw. The reduction in VAT across the board from 20% to 17.5%. I would hold out hope against hope that the Tories will listen. Hope against hope that for once they will think about the people who are most vulnerable, that they will take on board what we are doing. But conference, we have to push them to do it. We have to pass this motion today. It calls for the things that the people of this country need in a crisis that we haven't seen since I was a child. Conference, they need us to do it. Please not just for us, but for the sake of the country, pass this motion and call on the government to take these vital steps. Thank you. Christine, thank you for that introduction. Can I ask uh, Baroness Sal Brinton, please, to stand by? And I now call Baroness Jenny Randerson uh, to move Amendment 1. Jenny. Conference, this excellent motion has one big omission. And Amendment 1 seeks to address it. There's no mention of transport costs, which is a significant percentage of household expense for many families. On average, we spend 13% of our income on transport, and costs are rising at a rate of 14% a year. We talk a lot about working from home these days, but that's not an option for many. If you are a nurse, a shop worker, if you sweep our streets or collect our rubbish bins or service in restaurants, in all these and in many more jobs, working from home is not an option. And the lower your pay, the less likely you are to be able to work from home. In 2021, on average, we spent around £5,000 per household on transport and well over £1,000 per family on public transport. If you live in London, you're likely to spend more on public transport simply because there are good services to use. Whereas I realise that in many other towns and cities, services are poor and non-existent in many rural areas. But if you are young, old 
a woman or have a low income, you are more likely to rely on public transport. As a party, we believe in fairness and equal opportunities. And the environment and climate change are always our priority. So we have a strong body of policies to support and strengthen public transport. This amendment deals specifically with train fares. On the 1st of March, the Tory government increased them by 3.8%. And remember, it was the choice of the Tory government to do this. They abolished the franchise system for the railways and train operators are paid to provide the service the government dictates, with the income from fares going straight to the Treasury. The fare increase should be cancelled and train fares frozen for five years whilst this crisis in our cost of living continues, because we have the most expensive fares in Europe. And looking to the future, when fares are increased again, when they have to be increased again, they should be based on increases in the consumer price index rather than the retail price index, which is always higher. This isn't just technical jargon. As inflation shoots up, the gap between the two become greater in real terms. In January, for instance, the CPI was 5.5% and RPI was 6.8%, a difference of 1.3%. Whereas going back to last July, when inflation was much lower, the difference was only between 2% and 2.2%. Fellow Liberal Democrats, we must campaign at the local elections to come and well beyond to get these swinging increases reversed, to get rail fares frozen. Please support the amendment, support passengers and support public transport. Jenny, thank you for that. Uh, Can I ask Kevin Langford, please, to stand by? And I now have great pleasure in calling our health spokesman in the Lords, uh, Baroness Sal Brinton. Sal. Conference. This is a wide-ranging and important motion, and Christine's speech outlined the dire straits that many people are now finding themselves in as costs rise in so many areas. And as the mover of Amendment 2, I want to add my total support for the main motion and also for Jenny's Amendment 1 on rail fares. Daisy Cooper and I wanted to lay Amendment 2 because we think there's a worrying extra cost coming down the line in just over a fortnight, which will particularly hit the vulnerable and their carers and their families really hard. In the announcements made by Boris Johnson and Sajid Javid two weeks ago about lifting all the restrictions and precautions, they said that from the beginning of April, people will have to pay for lateral flow tests and the PCR test will be substantially reduced. Part of their learning to live with COVID strategy. However, there are three problems with this. First, just in case you hadn't noticed, COVID isn't over and lifting the restrictions has meant that today, the Zoe study has shown that cases are at an all time high since the beginning of the pandemic of over 221,000 daily cases with just under 2.5 active million active cases. And that's probably why everybody listening to this today will know at least one person, if not more, who's caught COVID in the last week. Yesterday, the World Health Organization reminded nations like the UK that even when a virus is endemic, it needs managing, including testing. Secondly, the prices of LFTs are high. And even without all the other increases in living costs, many families will find the cost too much. It's even more unpalatable that this money is going into the pockets of Tory friends. Thirdly, there are around 4 million clinically vulnerable people who still need to avoid COVID. People with blood cancer, who even if they are vaccinated four times, have no antibodies at all. People with autoimmune disease, who take strong immune suppressing medication that mean that their bodies have nothing to fight COVID with. They and their friends and families will still need to test regularly. At the moment, the government is talking about allowing one million of those clinically vulnerable people to have access to free testing. Not their carers, not their families, 
and not for friends who currently always test before they see them. And this means that as the government closes down all the surveillance from uh, testing from April, the daily NHS dashboard, the ZOE study, the REACT programme, the ONS surveillance and a number of other projects, the vulnerable and their families and friends will have no idea where COVID is, how much there is, unless they spend money on tests, which we currently estimate will cost around £600 a year or £12 a week per person. So the amendment says, keep them free for now. It makes sense to keep the clinically vulnerable safe. It makes sense to help carers and their families to be safe. And it makes sense not to further penalise the poorest in our community at a time when they are facing all the other costs outlined in the motion. And finally, conference, this is the first time that the public will have to pay for testing for a notifiable disease under the Public Health Act. That alone is a disgrace and we should object loudly to it. Thank, thank you, Sal. Um, can I ask uh, Oliver jones Lyons, please, to stand by? And now I call Kevin Langford from Kingston Borough to move Amendment 3. Good afternoon, conference. The, the Ukraine war coming on top of COVID makes us all poorer. The scale of this is massive. It's a crisis. Boris doesn't seem to get this. Christine does. But we can't avoid choices. We can't protect everyone from all the costs. We have to protect those on lowest incomes, particularly because universal credit has been squeezed so hard recently. We have to protect lower income households seeing large increases in energy bills. Well, the emotion does both of these things. But we also need to protect and improve the services government spends money on, which are also seeing a squeeze. We want to improve disastrous financing of social care, not let, get, let it get still worse as inflation further squeezes local authority budgets. We want to make sure that people working in the public sector don't see yet another real-term squeeze on their pay. And that's why I think we need to question a tax break, which mainly benefits the better off. That's why I question the proposal to end the freeze on personal allowances. Ending the freeze on personal allowances would be an expensive long-term reduction in taxes, which mainly benefits the better off. Cancelling the personal allowance freeze reduces annual tax revenues by 10 billion by 2026. Who does this benefit? 2 billion of the 10 billion goes to the richest 10% by income of households. 5.5 billion goes to the richest 30%. Only 7%, so 700 million, goes to people in the bottom 30% of households by income. So this is mainly a tax cut for those who are best able to deal with the cost of living crisis. At the next election, we're going to want to present a radical climate change agenda, a programme for better services, and a less flawed, but likely more expensive, set of benefits. That's going to cost money. We know, because we've done it many times before, that pulling together the manifesto is going to involve choices. And that if we give away 10 billion on a tax reduction, mainly for better off households, and either we have to be less ambitious about changing the manifesto, or we have to find more tax rises somewhere else. Put it another way. Either we can reduce taxes by 10 billion, mainly focused on richer households, or we can find some other better way of getting 700 million to lower income households and have the other 9 billion for the 9 billion that our Caring Society Working Party recommends is needed to resolve the social care crisis. Or 9 billion for the similar amount that we had in our 2019 manifesto for childcare and early years education. The motion demands that we and the government do what we can to help with the cost of living crisis. Other ideas, the temporary VAT cut, much better from a distributional perspective, could make it even stronger. Cutting taxes through ending the personal allowance freeze shouldn't be part of that program. Exclude this proposal that we end the personal allowance freeze from the motion, and the motion becomes a good progressive proposal. Its key long-term changes raise six billion from capital gains tax and spend 10 billion on increasing universal credit and pensions. It helps those most in need of help. Include the personal allowance freeze as well, and we're spending 10 billion on universal credit and pensions, but just as much, 10 billion, mainly on helping the better off. Is that where our priorities for the next election lie? Support the motion as amended by Amendment 3. 
Kevin, thank you for that. Uh, can I ask Neil Stockley, please, to stand by? And I now call Oliver Jones Lyons from Gateshead. Conference, I must admit, I was really quite confused when I read the agenda and saw the amendments to this motion. We have an excellent motion sitting in the ready, thoroughly outlining how this Conservative government has repeatedly failed to tackle the growing cost of living crisis, often actually worsening it. The first two amendments then build on this further. The first one tackling the rising cost of transport, second tackling the awful situation the Conservatives have put the people of this country in for the simple crime of wanting to keep themselves and vulnerable family members safe from a deadly virus. The third, however, simply removes two lines from the motion. Conference, these two lines were ending the freeze on the income tax personal allowance, ensuring that government isn't taking more money in tax away from hardworking families whilst their budgets are being hit by huge cost of living rises. I was even more surprised to see the names put down introduced and submitted the amendment. Two people I know have an excellent reputation in the party for really quite progressive policy. So that got me thinking, what might be a reasonable progressive rationale for this amendment? Could it be that they think that raising personal allowance is a less efficient policy lever for helping the poorest and they want more direct support? That very well could be a progressive argument that was made by Kevin there but only if if the amendment actually included a suggested alternative. I also don't really believe this to be a convincing argument in the face of the scale of the cost of living crisis before us. It isn't only hitting the poorest, who largely don't pay income tax thanks to the personal allowance, the hardest. It is hitting average earning families who do pay income tax as well. The 31 million people who pay the government an average of 22% of their earnings in tax. Could it be that the argument is that since it's a freeze on the allowance, it is a tax cut where the benefits was largely go to the rich and not ordinary workers. This was an also an argument made by Kevin. This may be an argument, but it would be incorrect. The tax freeze will drag 1.3 million low earners into paying income, income tax at a time where money is already tight. There is a positive case for ending the freeze. It can broadly be divided into three bases. A tactical vote winning argument, we're trying to win over blue wall voters. This is a policy that blue wall voters can back, keep more of their hard-earned cash as the, as the bills go up. There's a general economic case. We're coming out of a period of extreme economic disruption. There's a need for fiscal prudence, but it's not the time to be slamming on the brakes and raising taxes. And finally, there's a moral case. Inflation is rising faster than anticipated. We're in an energy price crisis, and soon there is a high risk of food supply, food supply disruption due to the war in Ukraine disrupting the supply of wheat globally. Surely we don't think now is the time to be dragging 1.3 million people into tax and causing a real terms increase in the tax packets of 31 million British workers. Let us be clear, conference, this is a stealth tax rise. The rates may be staying the same, but with rising inflation, the cost will be felt in pay packets up and down the country. The personal allowance being high enough to take millions out of income tax was a great Liberal Democrat achievement. Let's keep it rising when it needs to most. Conference vote down Amendment 3. Oliver, thank you. Um, can I ask Hannah Bettsworth, please, to stand by? And now I call Neil Stockley from Bromley Borough. Uh, Neil, you need to you need to unmute. Neil, thank you for making me seem hugely competent. I, I can't I can't hear you. That might be an issue on our side. I'll take that back. Okay, Neil, can you hold on? I'll just find out find out what's happening. Okay. Okay. We're having a quick break because we've got a technical problem uh, getting people through. Uh, we'll get back to the debate with Neil and then Hannah as quickly as we possibly can. So
Welcome back. Um, I do apologise for that break. And we're now going to try and connect back to Neil. Um, so Neil, uh, if you'd like to take us from the top again, uh, many apologies from headquarters for that. Okay. Household energy bills were set to go up by 50% to an average of £2,000 a year on 1st of April. But since Russia invaded Ukraine, they've, they're projected to go up to £3,000 a year over the next six months. Now, Nigel Farage and climate-denying conservative backbenchers, the Telegraph and the Spectator, are trying to tell us that this means we can't afford to make the transition to net zero and that energy policies should focus on ensuring secure energy supplies for consumers. And what's their solution? Double down on fossil fuels. Drill for untapped gas reserves in the North Sea and have another go at fracking. What they don't tell us is the UK is part of the international gas market and would remain vulnerable to external price shocks whether the gas came from here or another country. Or that even on the most optimistic estimates, North Sea gas will run out by the end of this decade or that shale gas would take 10 years to come on stream, even if the safety concerns that led the government to abandon fracking can be addressed. The solution is clear. We all need to use less gas. Now, Liberal Democrats' plans to boost clean energy are good news for consumers. Wind and solar are, are now much cheaper energy sources than gas. So are our plans for promoting energy and efficiency encouraging and enabling consumers to use and waste less energy from fossil fuels is a no-brainer solution. The Energy and Climate Intelligence Unit has found that the 6 million homes that have installed insulation measures since 2009 have saved nearly £200 a year on their bills. And the ECIU has also found that moving 1 million homes from band C to band D would reduce gas use by an average of 20%. Since 2012, though, the number of energy installations has dropped by 90% as the Conservatives have cut back or axed one energy efficiency policy after another. They made big promises at the last election, but Boris Johnson's government keeps on coming, coming up with low-quality schemes and then abolishing them, like the Green, green Homes Grant. We've got sound solutions to pro, pro, promoting an energy insulation, and we've said how we pay for them. We've got some bold solutions on energy pricing and taxation. But I just want to enter a caveat. The issues and challenges around household energy bills are only going to become more demanding over the coming months. We'll need to make sure that our policies on energy saving, zero carbon heating, and energy markets remain fit for purpose, and that the costs of benefits are shared clearly. And that we, the first party to commit to zero emissions back in 2007, remain committed and credible with energy strategies that work for consumers, protect the planet, and give us all more security. Neil, thank you very much for that. Again, apologies to conference for the uh, disruption. Uh, can I ask uh, Michael Berwick Gooding to stand by? And I now call Hannah Betsworth, who is speaking against the motion. Hannah. Um, thank you, conference. I am not speaking against the motion. I'm speaking against particular lines of the motion referring to the winter fuel allowance. And the reason for that is that I'm bringing up an issue my uh, grandma raises me at Christmas time. There's a lot of policy benefiting her generation and not very much at all going on in politics for her grandkids in their 20s to 30s, single young people who live alone or with flatmates. The reason that I'm looking for coming in on the winter fuel allowance is that our aim to use the profits of this tax on, on energy companies to help the most vulnerable is laudable, but the winter fuel payment doesn't target the most vulnerable. It gives a broad-based payment to all elderly people, including, and I hope my local party forgives me for this, people who are living abroad and wealthy pensioners while young people who currently live at home are having to pay back um, Rishi Sunak's uh, £200 loan on their energy bills over five years that they won't have got the benefit of. Young people are feeling neglected by political intervention that primarily benefits older generations, while they're the first generation set to be worse off than their parents. And Amendment 1 goes some way to rectifying the focus um, in this motion specifically on a lot of things that will benefit elderly people in particular. 
So I'm not saying I'm not opposing the motion. I'm not saying don't support this. There are lots of great things in it. But the motion should focus more on the measures within it designed to help people with low incomes across the board, rather than including very broad brush measures that give a sense of reinforcing intergenerational unfairness. So I'm, I'm definitely not saying that we shouldn't pass this. I'm saying that when we move forward into a policy looking at fairness more broadly, we need to keep that in mind. Thank you very much. Hannah, thank you very much for that. Can I ask Helen Morgan, please, to stand by? And I now call Michael Berwick Gooding from Basingstoke and Dean. I would like Michael. to speak. Sorry, I would like to speak to the clauses that have been accepted into the motion as drafting amendments. They were proposed as an amendment to the motion by my local party, and I'm really pleased that they have been accepted into the motion in their entirety. I was disappointed that we had to propose in line 91 of the motion the addition of extending the £20 uplift to universal credit to all the legacy benefits. Because at our last conference in September, I moved a similar amendment to the fairer, greener, more caring society motion to the clause which requested the government to retain the £20 uplift. Hopefully, when people talk about the restoration of the £20 uplift for universal credit, they will also add, and the legacy benefits. There are about 2.2 million households receiving the legacy benefits. Most of them receive employment and support allowance because they're not well enough to work. A welcome in clause five under conference further calls on the government, the extension of the warm home discount to those on universal credit. But again, the original motion didn't include those people on the income related versions of the legacy benefits, such as job seekers allowance and employment and support allowance. Whilst the number of people on these benefits is reducing, they should not be ignored. And I'm glad that if this, this motion is passed, we will not be ignoring them. The original motion didn't mention the cold weather payment. Such payments are made when the temperature falls to zero degrees centigrade or below for seven consecutive days from the 1st of November to the 31st of March. When this happens, people on certain benefits receive £25. But this rate has been frozen since September 2008. Those who receive this benefit are likely to be on pension credit, universal credit, income-related job seekers allowance and employment support allowance and either receive a disability premium or have a child who is disabled. They are among the poorest in society and need the extra support when it is very cold. It's therefore a good thing that this motion now is increasing it to £40. Again, I'm glad this has been included in the motion and I hope conference will pass this motion. I, would also, I also like the new policy included in the original motion of restoring the support for mortgage interest scheme to its pre-2018 format, including reducing the waiting time from 39 weeks to 13 weeks, lines 104 to 109. It seems strange that those who rent, if their rent is low enough, can have all of their rent paid from when they start their claim. But those with a mortgage have to build up 39 weeks of mortgage debt before the government will give them a loan to pay most of the mortgage interest, but not the interest on the 39 weeks arrears. Please vote for the motion as amended by the drafting amendment. Thank you. Michael, thank you for, your, for that and for explaining those drafting amendments. Can I ask Lee Darg to stand by? And I now have great pleasure in calling Helen Morgan, our MP for North Shropshire, uh, to speak. Helen. Thank you. <clears throat> Good afternoon, conference. I want to use my three minutes to give you some real life examples of the impact of the cost of living crisis and to demonstrate why it's so important that you support this motion today. One family in my constituency have written to me to tell me that their electricity bill has already increased from £81 to £274 a month, and that's before the price, crap, the price cap increases in April. This family can't afford to use their heating really and report that they can't get their washing dry either and their bedding feels damp because of the condensation forming in their house. Both parents are self-employed and have seen their businesses hit by the pandemic. They're working desperately hard to build those businesses back up again, really because if they don't, they face not being able to eat and losing their home. It's simply not fair that while some businesses have made enormous profits out of the pandemic and the energy price hike, Others face financial ruin for exactly the same reasons. A retired couple in my constituency wrote to me to tell me that because of the combined impact of removing the triple lock on pensions and the increase in energy prices, they were being forced to choose between heating and eating. 
their energy bill has already increased from £960 a year to £2,400. Another couple forced to give up their jobs because one has a heart condition and the other needs to care for him. They have to manage on benefits and their direct debit has already increased from £146 to £250 a month. The cold in their house is increasing the regularity of his chest pains and his risk of a stroke or even a fatal clot. And in the more rural parts of Britain, there's an additional element to this crisis, which is that people whose homes are off grid, relying on oil or LPG to heat them, aren't protected by the energy price cap in the same way. They also have to pay huge amounts up front to fill their tank up. And right now, we're even seeing shortages and rationing. I have constituents in their 70s with no access to heating or hot water. I was contacted last week by a lady with a severely disabled daughter and able to access an oil delivery, let alone pay for it. I don't have time to tell you about every struggling constituent that's got in touch with me because we'd be here for the rest of today. The measures in this motion are detailed and they are far reaching. They'd make a real difference to the lives of ordinary people who are facing actual proper financial difficulty. This current crisis is so extensive, it's hitting families who have not previously faced fuel poverty and those who are only too familiar with it are seeing a crisis like never before. It's just not right that this is being allowed to continue while companies that extract oil and gas and reaping billions as a result of what are for them very lucky circumstances. It is desperately unfair. Tax should be fair and it should be used to protect the vulnerable. And I believe the measures in this motion take the steps needed to right these wrongs. Conference, I urge you to support the motion. Thank you. Helen, thank you so much for that. Can I ask Rachel Bishop Firth uh, to stand by and I now call Lee Darg uh, from Central Birmingham. Lee. Thank you, Chair. You can see why I'm a proud West Midlander with Helen Morgan, our fantastic new MP. I'm also, like Christine, proud that we're discussing and debating this at conference, but equally appalled that we have to. Um, I'm for Amendment 1 and Amendment 2. Please vote those through. But I am against uh, Amendment 3. And one of the main reasons is I'm actually quite trustworthy of our party when it comes to spending money in government. Just look at what we prioritised in government. We raised the income tax threshold. We protected good pensions. We invested in early years and introduced a pupil premium. We kept maintenance grants for young people at university. And yes, we prioritised money in the NHS for mental health. All of that since we left government and especially in recent times has been rolled back. Some of those things have been scrapped altogether by this government that has just stopped caring for the people of this country. People do spend to their means also. And just because people are either on a higher tax bracket or they are on a higher wage, it doesn't necessarily mean that they aren't hit by all of the increases we see at the petrol pumps. We see food is going up, the clothing promises, everything across the board, as other people have mentioned, is going up. So I'm very much um, against uh, Amendment 3. At the recent uh, by-election here in Birmingham, um, I got to hear firsthand from the many people that were telling me just like Helen said, they're having to choose between heating and eating. It's become a bit of a political cliche now, but it's a very, very real thing. And people having to choose uh, not to feed themselves to make sure that their children get fed. It's just a, a horrific situation. And as ever, the hardest hit are those that need the most support, especially if you are disabled or you have additional or special needs. If you are black or brown, and if you are particularly young or particularly old, you need the most support. And yet these are the people that are being hit the hardest. We had a strap line in this party a few years ago that thankfully does still appear on tweets and focus leaflets. And that's demand better. Please, conference, pass this motion and Amendment 1 and Amendment 2 so that we can demand better from this callous, uncaring government and protect the people who need help the most. Thank you. Lee, thank you very much for that. Can I ask Lucas North to stand by? And I now call Rachel Bishop Firth from Wokingham Borough. Rachel. Good afternoon, conference. As this country goes through the most painful reduction in living standards for many decades, the Conservative government is forcing the young and those living on low incomes to bear the brunt of the crisis. 
After years of stagnating wages and price rises, many families were already in debt and using charities and food banks to survive. In work poverty was already a huge problem and many workers in vital roles such as retail, healthcare and transport rely on universal credit to top up wages which are too low to live on. If you're young in the UK, you're also battling on affordable housing costs. But it's the young and people on lower incomes that the current government has decided to target with tax rises and benefit cuts. I'd like to talk about one aspect of this, national insurance. National insurance is a tax, specifically a tax on wages. Income from other sources, such as pensions, share dividends, some rental income, is generally exempt from this tax. So when Conservatives chose to increase national insurance, they were by design choosing to increase the tax burden on one section of society, working people and their employers. The average 25-year-old will pay an extra £12,600 in tax over their working life because of this increase. Two million of the lowest income working British families, those who rely on universal credit or working tax credit to top, top, top up low wages, will pay additional tax because of this rise. Meanwhile, many wealthier people will pay no extra tax at all. How can this be fair? How can it be fair for our youngest and our lowest paid citizens to be given so much of this burden? This motion provides a comprehensive plan to address this grossly unfair situation. The Lib Dems would call on the government to scrap the unjust national insurance hike and it would reverse the universal credit cut. We do need to fund social care in the NHS. The Lib Dems would introduce a fair progressive tax on income, including capital gains. We would also work to ensure that corporations pay their fair share of tax. Conference, the Conservative government is failing our young people. It's failing British people who live on low incomes. Please show that the Lib Dems won't fail them and vote for this motion. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, can I ask Ollie Craven, please, to stand by? And I now call Lucas North from Manchester. Lucas. Good afternoon, conference. Um, it's great to be able to speak on uh, a, a really amazing motion with a, a wide range and a very comprehensive um, view on the cost of living crisis that is facing us. Uh, I'd like to thank the proposers of the motion and also the proposers of amendments one and two, which I hope you will join me in voting for. Um, it is unfortunate, I suppose, um, that I have to also speak against amendment three. Um, the, the cost of living crisis is a young person's crisis. It is a gendered issue as well. And it obviously affects the lowest paid in our society, um, an intersection of those identities, uh, which, we, which we can't just choose to ignore. So why is it a young person's issue? <laughs> because we know that young people are disproportionately in lower paid, precarious or part-time employment, whether that's because they're a student or because they're at the beginning of their career. Um, we know that that is the case. So young people are disproportionately among the lower earners that we've spoken about a lot in this debate already. We also know that it's a gendered issue because unfortunately we still far too often see women being paid less. And so we, we see women disproportionately among the lower earners. And so I, I think it's important when we, when we speak about this issue to remember the groups that will impact the hardest. Um, this, it, the the uh, proposer of the amendment said that only £700 million will go to the people who are on the lowest incomes. And, and that's true. I can't dispute that. That is a fact. But that £700 million will mean so much more to the people on those lowest incomes. Um, you know, we, we cannot say only 700 million when, when that can be the difference between eating or not. Um, and as, as Oliver said, this amendment does not propose any other way to get that 700 million pounds to those people. Um, that argument also ignores the fact that people who are not in the lowest income brackets, but in average incomes will also be hit by this. People from working families who will face the impacts of this, not simply the people on the lowest ever incomes, but people who are not the rich. Um, 
I think if we if we need to raise this money, which I think we do, it should not come from self-taxing the lowest earners in our society. It should come from taxing those who've seen record profits. And I'm glad that the motion addresses that and calls for that as part of the wording. So I would urge you in voting for the motion for Amendment 1 and Amendment 2, um, but sadly against Amendment 3. Lucas, thank you very much for that. Can I ask Sarah Olney to stand by? And I now call Ollie Craven, who wants to submit, or who is submitting, on Amendment 3. Ollie. Thank you. Conference. I'd like to thank Christine for proposing this motion and the proposers of Amendment 1 and 2. They have collectively proposed a number of strong policies to deal with the cost of living crisis. But conference, there is one policy in this motion I disagree with. Let's be clear. Reversing the freeze would cost at the very least £10 billion. Let's also be clear that the vast majority of this money would go to people who are already paying the higher rate of tax, that is, people who are already earning over £50,000. The idea that this freeze hits the poorest hardest is a lie. Oliver and Lucas mentioned that we hadn't included an alternative in our amendment. That is true. But there is also no mention of the great policy of a VAT cut that Ed Davey has launched at this conference. And yet we are championing it any and we are championing that anyway. To give you an idea of how much better this VAT cut is, the amp impact of the VAT cut is six times bigger than the impact of, of the freeze of the personal allowance for those on minimum wage, and it costs pretty much the same amount of money. Conference, it is not a liberal policy to be spending huge amounts of money on a tax cut for the rich. We could easily double the size of our VAT VAT cut instead, which would do far more for the poorest and for the struggling middle than reversing the freeze. Conference, I urge you to vote for all the amendments and the motion. Thank you. Ollie, thank you very much. And now we will have uh, Sarah Olney, the MP for Richmond Park and from the Twickenham and Richmond Local Party to summate for the motion as a whole. Sarah. Thank you very much, Conference. It's a pleasure to be here to summate this extremely important motion. Um, my colleague, Christine Jardine, has opened this debate uh, and presented the motion. Um, and the, the main features of it are we are, as I think everybody agrees, in this cost of living crisis, we are uh, anticipating price rises uh, across all um, so many different commodities and fuel bills, uh, and of course, tax rises uh, throughout the, the rest of this year. Uh, and it's something that we really do have to have a plan to tackle, uh, particularly on behalf of our low income households. And what we're proposing above all is to scrap the national insurance increase that the, uh, the Tories are proposing. We want to uprate pensions in line with the inflation forecast. We want to reinstate uh, the universal credit boost. We want to double the warm homes discount, extend it to everybody who's on universal credit and pension credit. Uh, and we would we pay for this in part with a windfall tax on our oil and gas producers. It's been brilliant to hear uh, so many contributions. Uh, my friend Baroness Randerson um, uh, talking about an amendment to, um, which I fully back, uh, to, to uh, freeze rail fares. Uh, an excellent point she makes about how 13% of household incomes are spent on transport. Um, Baroness Brinton making the excellent point about the need to keep uh, LFTs free, particularly for carers and those on low incomes. Um, Kevin Langford introduced Amendment 3, where he's opposed to, um, uh, where we're opposing freezing the, the personal allowance and he would like that to stay. He thinks it will have um, we think it will have the biggest impact for those on low incomes. Uh, Kevin's made an argument that uh, it actually also benefits people who've got higher incomes. Um, Oliver Jones-Lyons spoke against that. He, he highlights that no alternatives are being offered. Um, and uh, Lucas North also in his uh, contribution uh, said something very similar. Neil Stockley uh, making the excellent point about how we need to boost renewables, we need to boost insulation uh, so that we can reduce our reliance on expensive Russian gas and calling on uh, the government to do more to uh, replace some of their expensive failing schemes like the Green Homes Grant. Uh, Hannah Betsworth making a good point about winter fuel allowance, very much a benefit targeted at the older generation regardless of their income level and that we need to be thinking about targeting specifically towards people on low incomes. Uh, 
it was great to hear from Michael Bennick Gooding uh, about the drafting amendments. He made the excellent point, and this is something I've seen in my own constituency surgeries, that it's not just those on universal credit who need to see uh, the £20 uplift and the warm homes discount, but also those on legacy benefits. Uh, and I'm, I'm glad that his drafting amendment has been accepted. It was brilliant to hear from both of our, our two most recent by-election candidates. One of them, obviously, my new, um, my new very much appreciated colleague, Helen Morgan, who who told us some, uh, gave us some real life examples uh, from her constituency casework that she's seeing uh, of those living on low incomes and how government policy simply isn't helping them. And it was great to hear from Lee Dog, who I know is fresh from fighting the Birmingham editing. Erdington by-election on our behalf, arguing for the motion as a whole, as amended by Amendments 1 and 2. Rachel Bishop Firth made the excellent uh, point that um, the cost of living crisis uh, is very much hitting the youngest and the lowest paid, and they're bearing the greatest burden for solving it. And Lucas North made the same point as well. Ollie Craven was um, arguing in favour of Amendment 3, and he also mentioned, of course, the VAT cut uh, that we have uh, announced elsewhere in conference today uh, as being something that's going to have a massive impact. Um, conference, thank you so much for to everyone who spoke. This has been a wonderful debate. I would like you to vote uh, for Amendments 1 and 2, uh, a vote against Amendment 3, and then vote for the motion as a whole. Thank you very much. Sarah, thank you very much for that summation. Uh, we will now move to a series of four votes, uh, one on each of the amendments and then one on the motion as a whole. Uh, apologies to those uh, people who put in cards that we weren't able to um, call, but we'll now move to that vote. So can I see um, though you will now have the opportunity of moving in to vote uh, virtually in your polling slot. Uh, on Amendment 1. So those in favour of Amendment 1 and against is your opportunity to make that decision now. Thank you, Conference. We now have a result on uh, Amendment 1, and that is overwhelmingly carried by 214 votes in favour and four against. So Amendment number 1 is carried. We'll now move to the vote on Amendment number 2. So if you return to your um, polling apps, uh, the poll will be open now on Amendment number 2.
Thank you, conference. We now have the results on Amendment 2, and that has been, again, overwhelmingly carried by 223 votes for uh, to two votes against. 2234, two against. So we'll now move to the uh, vote on Amendment 3, um, and that vote is open now. Conference, we now have the results on Amendment 3, and that uh, is 158 votes for and 63 votes against. So 158 for, 63 against, Amendment 3 is carried. We'll now move to the final vote in this series, which is the vote on the amendment uh, as, uh, on the motion as you have just amended it. Uh, and your poll in your tabs will now open now.
uh, conference, um, thank you for bearing with us. Um, we have not proceeded with the vote on the motion as a whole, as I previously stated. Um, there has been a small hiccup uh, at, at this end, as those of you who have been observing the vote uh, for the Amendment 3. Those votes were called the wrong way round. So the result on Amendment 3 was in fact inverse. So that was 63 votes for and 158 votes against. So many apologies for that. So that as Amendment 3 is lost, 63 votes for, 158 against it. That means that we will now return to the motion uh, as you have amended it correctly uh, with Amendments 1 and 2 made to it, but not including um, the amendment contained in Amendment 3. So we'll now, if that's clear, apologies once again, we're now voting on the main motion as amended by Amendments 1 and 2 only. The polls were now open on that vote. Thank you for bearing with me, conference. I now have the result on the motion as amended. That is 212 votes for and two votes against. Um, so there is absolutely no doubt in your intention on that motion. 212 for, two votes against. That motion is carried as amended by amendments one and two. Thank you very much uh, for bearing with me. Uh, can I thank my aides, uh, Jenny Rigg and Chris Adams? Uh, and we now move uh, to item F31, um, which is a speech by Councillor Shafak uh, Mohammed. Uh, you will know Shaf best, I think, as one of our marvellous MEPs elected in 2019. Um, but now you'll know him even better as the leader of our group on Sheffield City Council. Um, here is Councillor Mohammed. So the best run councils in the country are led by Liberal Democrats. It's no surprise to us that four out of the five councils with the best recycling rates are Lib Dem led. 
In South Lakelands, the Lib Dems are building a thousand new homes that are affordable to rent. In Sutton, the Liberal Democrats have built the country's first net zero primary school and also the first passive house standard secondary school. In York, the Liberal Democrats are changing their corporate fleet to all electric and are also developing a high speed electric vehicle charging hyperhub. In the Cotswolds, the Liberal Democrat Council there are actually helping the poorest in society by giving them extra council tax support. These are real actions that Liberal Democrat councillors are delivering on the ground and more can be done if we can elect more Liberal Democrats this May. Many people have asked me, well, how did I get involved in politics and why did I actually stand for election to be a city councillor here in the town hall behind me? And the answer was quite simple. After many years doing voluntary community work and youth work in my local area, I realised that actually in places like Sheffield and towns and cities up and down the country where the Labour Party is pretty dominant is that they don't care what people think they have this attitude that they know best and don't matter how many times we came outside this town hall to hand in petitions and hold protests they would just carry on exactly the same way because they knew best so I realised that actually there was little point at shouting at the walls of this town hall you had to actually be inside this town hall to be heard and that was through the ballot box and that's why I stood to be a Liberal Democrat councillor here and once you're elected as a councillor then you are able to bring the concerns and views of residents right to the seat of power here at the town hall and hold not only the Labour Party to account but also the city council officers who are here to deliver services for all, pe all the people of our towns and cities. That's why it's important that we elect more Liberal Democrats because the more Liberal Democrats who are elected, the louder that voice can be for all our citizens in our towns and cities in the North and in the Midlands in particular. During the Covid pandemic, the sense of community was even more important than ever. So many people were left in isolation having to fend for themselves. As local councillors we became aware of a local luncheon club that operated within one of our local churches. But because of Covid and the need to self-isolate, this group of pensioners have not met for over a year. So working with my two ward colleagues, we decided to go to one of the best fish and chip shops in Sheffield. And actually we ordered fish and chips and peas. And then we took it upon ourselves to go around individually to these, in these luncheon club members to actually, as a surprise, give them a hot meal. And what was really, really interesting for me was that how grateful these elderly members of our community were. And what was heart-wrenching for me was that when I heard from one of them that that fish and chips, when he called me afterwards, was the first hot meal he had that wasn't warmed up in a microwave. That really came home to me how COVID had totally devastated the way of life of so many people. So therefore it's really important that we value communities. And that's why we as Liberal Democrat councillors are always embedded in our communities. We work with our communities. We are in touch with them throughout the year. And, and when it comes to issues like luncheon clubs that couldn't meet, we actually stepped in, used our local ward pot budget that was devolved down to us and actually made that small bit of difference that actually brought great cheer to the lives of a group of pensioners that spent almost 18 months in isolation because some of their carers were also having to isolate and that for me showed the real value of having Liberal Democrat councillors embedded into their local communities and the differences they can make and that's why I'm so keen that we elect more councillors this May. At the hearts of many communities, there are buildings, whether they are places of worship, like a mosque, or a church, or a synagogue. Or in the case here, within the community that I reside in, it's this community hub here, that used to be an old Roman Catholic church that went into disrepair. And I'm proud that when I chaired this forum, we, set, we renovated this building, made it into a community hub, which now houses a library. Advice sessions used to be delivered from here, and young people can drop in for support looking for work and training opportunities. So that's why as Liberals it's really important that we 
value community so much and, and it always be at the heart of everything we do and electing more Liberal Democrat councillors will allow us to help many more communities. One of the key things I've learned over many years campaigning for the Liberal Democrats has been that actually it's not just about the candidate but it's also about the team and in particular the back office team and the work that goes off preparing for action days and ward drops and this year more than anything, the key thing is going to be about how we are prepared for the postal votes. So all right now, already, we are preparing um, the next drop of our literature to go out with application forms to vote by post, because I think the postal vote this time around is going to be the thing that will win or lose elections for us. And my plea to all Liberal Democrats standing for election and those teams that are now helping to prepare for those elections is that please remember to have a postal vote campaign, not just to recruit postal voters, but also to think about how we're going to timetable our literature to drop, just to ensure that those postal voters don't miss out on the full campaign that those people who will vote on a day get. So my, my plea to you is, please look at your literature. ALDC have got a huge amount of resources that they will be able to help with. There are templates out there, and let's make sure that we win the postal vote because I'm sure that will allow Liberal Democrats to be elected in our towns and cities right across the country. We're now weeks away from polling day and it's more important than ever that Lib Dems right across the country come out and support. So if you live in an area where there's normally not a Liberal Democrat candidate, my plea to you is consider standing. If we've already got a Liberal Democrat candidate there, please go and support them. But also contact your regional party and find out where our key target seats are, where we're trying to gain the councils, where we're trying to move forward parliamentary. Let's get out there, let's get campaigning, and let's get some more Liberal Democrats elected so we can actually make a real difference to our communities who desperately need Lib Dems to actually bring that positive change after being let down by Labour for many, many years. Good afternoon, conference. Uh, I'm Cara Jenkinson, and we now move to policy motion F2 on criminal records. You'll find that on page 79 of the agenda, and there are no amendments to the motion. Uh, so I now ask Helen Maguire to stand by and call Tom Campion of Newcastle upon Tyne to propose the motion. Tom. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Conference. A word I hear often in political spaces at the moment is progressive. And at a time when this Tory government is doing its best to roll back our rights, clamp down on our civil liberties and undo decades of work, there has never been a more important time for a strong, progressive and importantly, liberal voice. Our liberal voice. Now, six months ago, the issues around criminal records were completely unknown to me. It was just not something I was aware of. I didn't know that, for example, one in six people in England and Wales have a criminal record. I didn't know that over 10,000 people each year receive prison sentences of less than a month that must be declared if that person wants to work in a field requiring an enhanced disclosure and barring service check or DBS check. But it gets worse. You see, if you receive a sentence, suspended or not, of even just a day, this still has to be declared as part of that enhanced DBS check, actively holding people back from being able to get on with the rest of their lives. Now, you may be thinking, what's the point? Why does this matter? Well, conference, at the moment, one in three men of a working age have a criminal record in England and Wales. And given that nearly 50% of employers have said they wouldn't hire someone with a criminal record, we are at a crisis point. Now, this can lead, of course, to a slippery slope where those who may have only made one very minor mistake, potentially when they were young and foolish, as we have all been at some point, 
that these people can end up having their entire lives ruined in a flat. Not only this, but there is a clear link conference between those who have found themselves needing to rely on the benefit system and those who have been through our broken justice system, with 33% of benefit claimants having a criminal record. This is clearly holding these people back. Now, finally, you may or may not know that if you are arrested, even if no further action is taken, then this can still be disclosed by the police as part of an enhanced DBS check, if they deem it necessary. Now, I don't know about you, Conference, but given the police's recent track record, as their tendency as well of some forces to maybe arrest first and ask questions later, this does seriously concern me. Conference, fundamentally, our criminal record system is illiberal, discriminatory, and no longer fit for purpose. Now, today, we have a chance to be the strong, progressive, and liberal voice, pushing to make our country a more fairer and caring society, where we move away from the demonization of those with criminal records and instead pivot to support and rehabilitation that will allow people to start again, not end up in the negative downward spirals we so often see. This motion would make our party the most progressive party on criminal record reform. Although it may be seen by some as potentially too radical or one step too far, what this motion calls for is sensible, evidence-based changes that we know will have some of the most effective and impactful positive results. Now, there will be concerns, obviously, and questions over safety, whether this will allow those who wish to do society harm into positions where they can do this. But I strongly believe that what we have set out in conference calls for is pragmatic, realistic, and ultimately fair. There will unfortunately always be those who wish to do us harm, but this will always be a tiny minority who will find those loopholes no matter what. This motion will give people a second chance, remove the shadow of their past actions and allow them to move on, start again and try and lead the life they want to. Conference, I beg you, please be the liberal and progressive voice we talk about so often and vote for this motion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tom. Um, and could I um, ask Sally Burnell to stand by? And I now call Helen Maguire from Elmbridge. And Helen is speaking against lines 23 to 28 and 32 to 38 and 41 to 42. So, Helen. Good afternoon, conference, and thank you for accepting my request to speak on this issue. So I'm a former Royal Military Police Officer, and so I have a keen interest in this area of policy. Furthermore, I'm the mother of teenagers, and so this is a very hot topic for me as a parent. Overall, I absolutely agree with the spirit of the policy motion proposed by Tom. Young people can be unnecessarily criminalised, and there are potentially unintended consequences of this. And this is something that as Liberal Democrats supporting Liberal values that we do need to address, and I'm supportive of a policy that doesn't criminalise young people for life. However, today I'm speaking against this motion. Now, I'm by no means an expert on this, and so to inform my view, I've consulted further with a defence lawyer, a magistrate, and a former Deputy Police Commissioner at the Metropolitan Police. The overriding feeling is that this is an absolutely important issue that requires review, but that further clarification on the detail is required. So referring to line 32, ending the blanket ban of retention of all criminal records. So currently, if you're arrested and charged but subsequently not convicted, then you may apply for the deletion of your biometric data and PNC records if you have no previous conviction. Now, I agree that this area does require further improvement, but what we do have to ask is what should the police record? What can they weed out and what is required to be weeded out from the data that they hold on the PNC? We need improved clarification on what data should be held and improved policy on the rights of rehabilitated individuals to apply for their record to be deleted. And, and, and we also need reform of the Rehabilitation of Offenders Act 1974. Referring to lines 26 to 28. Now, I believe there's a balance to be struck here. There does unfortunately exist cases such as the Sowa murders, where the non-disclosure of criminal record information to the school led to the employment of Ian Huntley that led to the murder of two innocent schoolgirls. Now, I recognise that this is a really rare case, but it does happen. And so the retention and disclosure of data can prove a real public benefit. Referring to lines 41 to 42, I do worry that determining whether a criminal record should be held or not by the seriousness of the offence may not be the most appropriate way of judging the offence. 
The outcome of a case may be better determinant as it's gone through due process. There are, for example, different levels of the same crime, such as robbery, nicking cigarettes from a petrol station to robbing a bank. Each of these offences would be considered a serious offence, but each would be sentenced differently according to the severity of the crime. Finally, I feel that we need to clarify the area of police discretion. Currently, legislation given to the police on what discretion they have if they find themselves in the position of arresting a young person with drugs does not extend to Class A drugs, and it should. This is a further area for review. So in summary, as a Liberal Democrat supporting Liberal values, I fully support the spirit of this policy motion and believe that having once been found with a joint on you is not reasonable grounds to maintain a criminal record and be labelled for life. However, This policy, I feel, requires further clarity, and I would recommend that this policy is not supported today in its current format, but is sent back to the Federal Committee for further review and brought back at the Autumn Conference. Thank you, Conference. Thank you very much, Helen. Um, And I now call on Sally Burnell um, from Waltham Forest. um, And could Alex Alex, uh, Kimmins please stand by? Thank you. Sally. Thanks very much, Cara. And thank you to Tom and the Young Liberals for this excellent motion, for putting this important but often neglected issue onto our agenda. It's far too easy for politicians to play to the gallery and say, tough on crime, lock them up, throw away the key and to hell with humanity. Maybe it's a vote winner in the short term, but we know it will do absolutely nothing to address reoffending in the future. If society tells people that just because they made one or two mistakes, that's it, they're out, where do we expect them to go? If we genuinely care about reducing reoffending, then we must put systems in place that support people to get and keep a job and have somewhere to live. Our whole philosophy as Liberal Democrats is to believe in people, in individuals, and to support them to have the best life chances. And when it comes to those with a criminal record, as this motion sets out, that means taking a more proportionate approach. I used to work for the crime reduction charity NACRO, And amongst other things, they provide advice and guidance to ex-offenders and employers about criminal records. Many years ago, after visiting a NACRO project up north, I was on my way back to London. And in one of those quirks of the train operating companies, I ended up getting a cheap first class ticket. So there I was sitting on a table with three other people who were all suited and booted. And we got chatting about why we were traveling and what we'd been up to that day. I talked about NACRO and the work that we did with ex-offenders. I explained the difficulties ex-offenders face in getting employment and the stigma associated with criminal records. At that time, around a quarter of adults had a criminal record. So I said, did you know that one in four adults has a criminal record? So maybe one of us four. And without skipping a beat, they jumped in horrified. Well, it must be you. Yeah, thanks for proving my point, I thought. The stigma in society is real and it's holding people back. I have the luxury of laughing off those people on the train. And more importantly, I have the luxury of not worrying about that section on a job job application that can strike fear into the heart of someone who's working really hard to move on with their life. Declaring convictions for employment is a complex area, whether convictions are spent or unspent, whether the role is exempt from the Rehabilitation of Offenders Act, the language keeps changing. It's too easy for employers to take a blanket approach to make sweeping decisions about which roles require its standard or enhanced checks. In many cases, it's not actually lawful requirement for them to carry out the check, but that's not what they tell prospective employees. And there's no incentive for someone who does have a criminal record to challenge the company that they're applying to work for. So they just quietly take themselves out of the running for the role again and again. So alongside this excellent motion, I'd reiterate our support for the Unlock campaign to ban the box, to roll out fair access to employment to educate and monitor employers so that they take a more supportive and inclusive approach. Everyone deserves a second chance and sometimes a third or fourth or fifth. This motion says we don't give up on people. Please vote for it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sally. Um, So I have uh, just received a um, a reference back. Um, However, according to the standing orders 11.2, Um, uh, which say a voting member who has not already spoken in the debate may at any time before the chair has asked the first speaker in reply to stand by submit in writing a request to refer the motion back under debate. Now, actually, um, that was uh, received just as I was calling that um, first speaker uh, uh, in reply. Uh, So uh, on those grounds, I'm not going to take the reference back and I will now move 
to um, Alex Kimmons, who will be summating the motion. Alex. And Alex, yes. uh, I think you're muted. I'm afraid my mic is on. We can hear you. Okay, I will continue. Sorry, thank, thank you. Um, yes, thanks to Tom Campion for proposing the motion and for recognising uh, that the evidence supports an urgent need for criminal record reform. Um, I would first like to recognise the points made by Helen Maguire. Thank you for your input on this uh, motion. We really appreciate it. Um, I recognise the specifically the points made about the serious, seriousness of the offence and how this does not always um, reflect uh, the offence in question, the conviction in question, and what may be appropriate going forward. I think the point I would make there is that in a lot of cases at the moment, um, people are actually negatively impacted by the way that offences are uh, framed and are written. So, for example, I work with the Fair Checks movement for criminal records reform, and one of our supporters, um, Maureen, uh, came across her younger sister being harassed uh, by a man on the street and it escalated. She pushed him away. He fell and lightly grazed his hands. And this was recorded as grievous bodily offence um, on her criminal record. Now, I think we can agree that a graze of the hands, while, you know, a difficult outcome, is not something that should stop somebody from getting work uh, 10 or 20 or 30 years later. But that's exactly what happened to Maureen. 35 years after the fact, she was fired from her job as a dinner lady at a school because her enhanced check showed a conviction for grievous bodily harm. And her new employers thought that this was made her too much of a risk. Uh, I recognise the need for clarity on this complex issue, uh, but think it's important to, to balance that with the hundreds of thousands of people whose lives are made much more difficult because of this complex language around criminal records, which can make it appear that something, that a mistake they made potentially decades ago is more serious than it is. Uh, once again, I would like to thank Sally, Sally Burnell for her supportive comments and for recognising the stigma that people face uh, when they have a criminal record. As she mentions, the language around criminal records is complex, constantly changing, um, and even people in the know, even people in the sector uh, often find it difficult to pin down exactly whether someone does have a criminal record, what will show on that record, um, and whether someone in fact needs uh, a record check. Uh, as Sally mentions, while there are strict rules around disclosure of barring service checks, often employers don't get it right. They might ask for information they're not legally entitled to. And people with criminal records who may very well be nervous in the interview or in the, the application to a job because they understand the stigma around records may end up disclosing information they're not legally required to disclose um, if it is asked of them, in a, even if that is in an unlawful way. Um, so thanks to everyone who's spoken uh, on this motion. Overall, uh, I would support what Tom has said in that we understand that there, there will be concerns over safety. There is a need for criminal records in some capacity, but what we're calling for is a much more flexible approach to this issue. Uh, we're suggesting that things should be reviewed on a on a uh, individual basis uh, rather than these lifetime stamps of one day in prison even being revealed forever if you want to go into social services. Um, and so overall, I would thank everybody and ask that you support this motion. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Alex. So we now move to a vote on the motion uh, as a whole. Um, so you'll see that vote coming up now in your polling tab.
Right, we now have the results back from the vote um, and it's 135 for the motion and 17 against. I'd like to thank my aides, uh, Jenny Rigg and Chris Adams, and also to the speakers in the debate. And we now move on to the auditorium break, a little bit earlier than expected. Um, and we, but I would uh, ask you to uh, go along to the fringe uh, with Kira Rudik um, from uh, the Hollis Party in Ukraine. Uh, that's on at 5.40, and you'll find that under fringes and training uh, on the Hopin uh, app. So... Thank you very much. We'll see you later.